Hello, my name is Gary Davis. I am a technical specialist with Autodesk Media and Entertainment, and this is a recording that was done exclusively for Autodesk University 2011 and will be rebroadcast on my blog at area.autodesk.com, which you can find under blogs. Uh, this specific session is going to be about, as the title indicates, the other GPU renderer. This is 3ds Max 2012 and Quicksilver Rendering. The session summary, today I'm going to be talking about GPU hardware accelerated rendering and uh, a lot of talk about the iRay rendering engine, but today we're going to be focusing around the Quicksilver hardware renderer. We're going to be looking at two things, primarily uh, showing near realistic renders as well as stylized rendering options that are now available. And we're also going to be showing some tips and tricks, uh, including some scripts and the use of 3ds Max Composite to uh, further sweeten your finished renders. Now this is my kind of tongue-in-cheek uh, analogy here. When comparing the two uh, Hilton sisters, you can see here that my, I make a comparison of Paris I Ray Hilton. This is the renderer, the new, newer renderer in 3ds Max that gets a lot of attention from the media. And, uh, and then I say, then there is Nikki Quicksilver Hilton. She is also a viable production renderer, having a few similarities and differences with her sibling, but she doesn't get the coverage in the world press. Poor, poor Nikki. Well, this again is my tongue-in-cheek way of saying we've got two new renderers that are available within 3ds Max, both iRay and Quicksilver, that take advantage of GPU rendering. However, one of them gets a lot more attention in the press, which is iRay. The focus of this class is to focus on the other renderer, Quicksilver, and that's why I say, does this make her an underdog? No, I think not. Uh, there's basically going to be options and times when either of those renderers are going to be good. And today I'm going to focus on, obviously, the Quicksilver renderer. First, I'm going to start off with some similarities and differences to iRay. Then we'll be moving into GPU acceleration within 3ds Max and also specifically targeting DirectX and the Nitrous viewports. Then we'll take a look at the Quicksilver renderer itself as well as render elements within Quicksilver. And we'll be closing out the session with tips and tricks, including Autodesk Composite. So that's our agenda for the day, and let's get started. In the help files for 3ds Max, I'm under Rendering, Renderers, Quicksilver Hardware Renderer. Obviously, there's a lot of good information in there about the renderer itself, but I wanted to start, about, start out with a very important consideration here, and it does say it's important. To use the Quicksilver Hardware Renderer, your graphics card must meet Shader Model 3.0 or later, and that's a DirectX thing. This is not considering OpenGL whatsoever. So shader model 3.0 is an important aspect to you know take advantage of Quicksilver or to be actually to have to be able to use it at all. If I come over here to this tab in this particular laptop that I'm using to record this video, you can see I have a Quadro FX 3800M uh, by Nvidia, and if I scroll down here, you can see that it does in fact support shader model 4.0. So I know that I'm going to be uh, you know a okay with this particular video card. However, as the help file says here, if you are unsure which graphics card you have, choose 3ds Max Help Diagnose Video Hardware, and it displays information about it. However, I'm going to show you a little bit of a bug here. Now, before I do this Help Diagnose Video Hardware, I want to show you that I'm actually in uh, 3ds Max 2012, and I'm using the newest uh, Nitrous graphics driver, which is in fact recommended, and I do recommend it as well. Direct3D will also work, so either of these two are going to work for the Quicksilver hardware renderer. However, Nitrous is going to support more things in the viewport and at render time. Having said that, if you are using Nitrous, and let me cancel out here, and I go to the help file and say diagnose video hardware, there's a little bug that it doesn't actually report that shader model that we that we're looking to find here so a couple of things that you could do I could actually either manually change that myself or I'm just gonna exit out of Max and I'm gonna come over to the Windows start and say let's start all programs let's go to Autodesk Max 2012 and there's this option to say change graphics mode so I'm gonna launch 3ds Max again and it's gonna prompt me as if it were kinda of like a new install I'm not resetting the default preferences or anything like that I'm just asking Max to launch into a mode where it asks me which video mode do I want to be in. So for just for it's temporarily, I'm going to go into DirectX just to diagnose that video hardware. Now again, I know that I'm using a Quadro FX 3800M with shader model 4.0, so I know that I'm going to be okay. But if you're not sure, this is a way that you can uh, do it yourself. So after my default scene loads up here, yeah, that's fine. I can say, let's go to help.
diagnosed video hardware, and now I'm getting the full report where it does in fact say GPU shader model, I'm using DirectX 9, which video card I'm using, and so on. But that's what I'm looking for right there, is that it supports a shader model of at least 3.0 or later. So now I can either manually go back to my Nitrous viewports, or in this case, I'm gonna say, just go back to start, program files, Autodesk, Max 2012, change graphics, view mode, and this time when I go back in, I'm gonna be using Nitrous from this point on. All I wanted to do was get around that little bug that Nitrous doesn't report the shader model, but I do in fact wanna take advantage of, and I'm gonna say revert from Direct3D, go back into Nitrous, and then from this point on in the session, I will be using the Nitrous viewports. As I said a second ago, there are some definite similarities to iRay with the Quicksilver hardware renderer. Uh, one of the things I want to talk about is both the Quicksilver hardware renderer and its similarities and differences to iRay, and also these new Nitrous viewports. And just to remind you, I'm under Customize, Preferences, Viewports, uh, and we're using the new Nitrous uh, renderer for the viewport. Now, that Nitrous isn't a renderer. Let me correct myself immediately right there. Nitrous is a viewport configuration and Quicksilver is the hardware renderer version of these viewports. Now the Quicksilver renderer doesn't need to use Nitrous, but they can work well together. Uh, and Nitrous does give you all the bells and whistles of the newer versions of Macs. To configure Nitrous, if you just go into the viewport configuration dialog here, this is where you've got visual style and appearance. And right now I'm in realistic. I'm gonna talk about these other uh, non-photorealistic ones in a moment, but I'm gonna stay up at the highest realistic here. And just briefly go through some of these. You can illuminate your scene with default lights or scene lights. Display highlights or not if you want to. There's also a lighting and shadow quality uh, you know, multiplier. I'm just going to leave this at 1.0 for most of the time here. Then we also have the enable options to enable shadows and ambient occlusion directly in the viewport. One other thing to mention here is this hardware shader cache. This is a similarity actually to iRay and that I've changed this. Uh, default path here. You can change it either here in the viewport configuration dialog because it does in fact using uh, hardware shaders using DirectX and the Nitrous video uh, driver. But we can set this up either here and obviously there's a path browse. I'm going to cancel this out and just show you that another place. If I come up under customize configure system paths here is this hardware shader cache. And you might notice that I've actually made a media cache directory on the root of my uh, C drive. That's actually because I'm using a, a couple of other different applications that all cache. I've got, uh, for example, Adobe Bridge, After Effects 5.5. I've also got Autodesk Composite, or also known as Toxic back in the day. And those are all caching to this root directory media cache. So I've manually changed that. One other place that you can get to that is in fact the render dialog. And I'm not gonna get too crazy uh, talking about the render cache uh, any more than I am right here. But if I just come down to the bottom of the actual hardware cache, this is a third place that you can set it. And this is all setting the exact same setting. It's just three places within the Max interface to get to the same setting. But let's talk about the Nitrous viewports for a second. If I maximize this viewport, and I just start arc rotating around, so this is not a render, this is actually you know, our Nitrous viewports. One of the most important things about this is there's this thing called progressive refinement. And you'll notice as I release the cursor or the mouse, there's actually, a, a, the hardware is actually drawing in the display better and better. So as I'm manipulating my scene around in realistic mode, and I'll reemphasize this is in fact realistic mode that's doing this, I can you know get very fast responsive uh, interactivity, but then when I release the mouse, there's these iterative, there's an iterative process going through that's actually making the viewport look better and better. And it's things like ambient occlusion and soft shadows and things like that. Well, the way that that impacts Quicksilver is found in the renderer. Now, before I really get into this iteration talk, what I first wanna do is describe some more similarities with uh, iRay and in fact, some of the other renderers. Now, if I bring up the render dialog and go into the common tab, if I close all these up, um, typically assigned renderer is down here at the bottom of the list. Uh, just so you know that I've, by default, I always make this and drag and drop this up to the top because I flip flop between renderers quite often. So that's why when you see me working with my uh, standard render dialog here like this, that um, configure renderer is going to be up at the very top of my options here or assign renderer. 
Now, like I said, it is in fact a renderer. That's kind of the whole point here. <laughs> We've got our mental ray renderer, our eye ray renderer, the default scan line renderer, and then this particular scene is in fact set up for Quicksilver, as you can see here. But the important thing to know here is that obviously, you know, we might want to dismiss this as saying, yeah, we've got four renderers in Max. Uh, you know, which one do I use? Which one's better? Which one's worse? And there's really no right or wrong answer to that. Um, but they are, in fact, renderers. Now, when we talk about Quicksilver being a production renderer that is essentially a game engine type renderer for these viewports, a lot of people want to think to, you know, you say, why wouldn't I just come up to tools and say view grab still image file or grab animated sequence file when that in, is in fact a way to grab the viewport and write it out to either a single image or an animated sequence like an AVI or an image sequence of targas or JPEGs or PNGs or whatever you want. While these are actually uh, okay to do, and I'm, you know they're not taking away this feature, the issue here is that this is not the same thing as using an actual renderer. When I do this grab viewport, and if I want to grab a still, that's no big deal because it really just takes a quick second and it you know just pops that in there. One of the things you'll notice is that the camera icons are actually still in the view, and that's something we might want to eliminate. We also have our icon down here of our axes, and you can actually obviously see that I'm in arc rotate mode, so we're seeing... Um, you know, the uh, arc rotate dialogue there. And our friend, the view cube is up in the corner and we've got our polygon counts. So these are things that, you know, you might not otherwise want in a production renderer. Even if we're doing um, some other, using another renderer as our final production renderer, we might use Quicksilver along the way uh, to do some test renders or test animation reviews for clients and things like that. So by having it as a production renderer, not only are you eliminating all those uh, viewport icons from being within the screen, but it is in fact a renderer. And that means that you can render on up 9,999 machines, just like these other renderers that are included now with Max out of the box. So most importantly, in my opinion, what that means is that you can queue up jobs. Now, the fact that this is a hardware renderer and that gives you a speed that it's you know rendering very, very quickly on the graphics card, even though that's the case, when I come up and said tools, grab viewport, and grab animated sequence file, when I do this, or in the old days, this used to be called make preview, no matter how fast this is, when I go ahead and create that file, it's going to be writing out a file to disk, and my computer is actually tied up. So right now you can see that it's creating a preview, and it's going through, and this is only going to take a couple of seconds, or would if I were to let it finish. I am going to, in fact, cancel this for time's sake just say stop and don't play but you could see that what ha was happening is that it was using the hardware to make a preview on uh, of my viewports on the video card and write it out to a file and that could be fine and well and those are there's many times that you'll still want to do that function but it is tying up the machine as opposed to using a dedicated renderer where I can write files out to disk and opt to network render. Now, this isn't going to be a talk about network rendering, but some of you may know that I'm very uh, active and very involved in uh, network rendering, and specifically with 3ds Max. Uh, one of the benefits, a lot of people say, you know, I only have one computer, so I don't network render. Uh, one of the benefits of network rendering, even if you have only one computer, is a job queue. So think about having the ability to queue up multiple jobs, and then when you go to lunch or go home for the night, for example, you can start up the queue in Backburner or other queue management software applications, and then your jobs will, you know, one will render, the other one, uh, the next one in line will start rendering, and so on. So when you have a job finish, you're not going to be... Uh, you know, having a machine sit around all night long or, or while you're uh, away from the machine, you can actually have a queue of jobs. And I can't emphasize enough how much you can learn from just queuing up different versions of a scene and uh, going ahead and net rendering this. So that's going to be one of the major similarities with iRay is, in fact, the fact that it's a dedicated renderer and that it is, uh, you know, able to have unlimited network rendering throughout 3ds Max. One similarity we saw, just to reiterate, is that the fact that they are a renderer and that they share this caching system. I'm just going to close these up and I'm going to talk about these uh, dialogues in a little bit. So they share this caching system. And the fact that we're rendering on the GPU doesn't mean that the CPU is ignored during this process. Fundamentally speaking, the a similarity between both iRay and the Quicksilver hardware renderers is that when you hit renderer, the CPUs in the system create these hardware shaders and in fact, port them once they're created onto the graphics card. Uh, 
So there's going to be an upfront calculation, and that's similar to both of these renderers. When you go ahead and hit the render button, there's an upfront calculation to com create and compile some hardware shaders, and then it puts them onto the video card for actual manipulation, and in the case of iRay and Quicksilver, for rendering. So that's going to be this hardware cache is going to be something that's important. And generally speaking, the, uh, the way that I understand this, the way that it is explained to me and from my own use, the more that you use iRay and Quicksilver, the larger this cache will get. Now, this is not something that becomes a gigantic file, but it is something I like to know where it is as opposed to using just the user defaults and having it kind of buried away into the system files. I like to know where things are and uh, you know keep an eye on them as 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 I'm especially as I'm learning them to monitor you know what's uh, creating issues with me what what file sizes are and that kind of thing. So moving along, I'm going to close up uh, the hardware cache and just talk about this very top section here, which is the most common uh, way of looking at rendering in both iRay as well as Quicksilver. So this is another similarity and probably the biggest. Fundamentally speaking, these both of these renderers have a very different way of working in that you can define how long something takes to render. So if I'm under the Common tab and I'm going to say I want to render a single frame of HD resolution, I'm not going to save this out, but I just want to render a single frame, and then I come under the Render dialog, what I can do is define how long is that render going to take, and I could say maybe 20 seconds for this render. Now as soon as I hit Render, this is going to be our first render, and you'll see this it's for transforming vertices. This is all happening on the CPU. Uh, it didn't happen that fast, actually. That was a rendering that I did ahead of time. But over here, I'll draw your attention. You can see that it's compiling the shaders. Now it's doing the rendering, and you'll see that it is, in fact, doing a what's called a progressive refinement. So it's in a very similar way to iRay. It's drawing the image to the viewport very quickly, or to the display buffer, and then it's getting better and better as you go. Now we're at 70%, 84%, 90%, and it's about finished. So there, we're finished and our frame buffer, our render dialog is going to go get dismissed. And that did in fact take 32 seconds. I don't know if you can see this uh, render time down here. This is not a new feature in Max. It actually always shows you the last render time. And it says 32 seconds. Well remember we asked it to render a frame in 20 seconds so that obviously means something was happening for 12 seconds there. What that is is the creation of those hardware shaders and the caching of this scene onto the, onto the video card. So in this case, it's almost you know pr roughly half the time or a third of the time is spent putting it onto the video card. Now that's you know good and bad. Uh, it's good because the renderer it means the renderer is so fast. Uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing that it's taking up a third of its time when you can when you figure it's only 30 seconds for a single frame. But it is something to consider that when you have the ability to control how long something takes in time. That gives you the option to say, you know, let's say, for example, we were going to render this animation and it's 300 frames. Typically, with something like Metal Ray uh, or any other uh, software renderer, including Scanline or V Ray or another final renderer in Brazil and so on, if I have 300 frames of HD and I come over to the renderer and I hit render, typically you're going to have to have done lots of tests to figure out how long something's going to take. Well, in this case, I could say if I render 20 seconds per frame, Estimated time for total for 301 frames is one hour and 40 minutes and 20 seconds. So this is a very key way thing about both iRay and Quicksilver is that you can define how long something is going to take. Now, like a similarity to other renderers, these two share a common similarity in that the longer they go, the better it'll look. But there is a point of diminishing return, and you know, with this hardware renderer happening so quickly to do something that takes 20 seconds as opposed to say five minutes and I'm not going to do a five minute render let's even just do um, let's do a one second render in fact if I do a one second render it's going to take some time to compile on the video card whoops and let me just go back and render a single frame so it'll take once again it's going to take some time to compile on the video card and then we'll see our rendering so here's our finished rendering, and it did in fact take nine seconds to do that one second render. Obviously, there was some work being pushed around uh, to get to the video card, but it's not bad. You know, it looks pretty good for a one second rendering. It looks pretty much just like the viewports. Uh, some things that I'll point out that it didn't do that well in one second is real uh, nice anti-aliasing along these very high contrast lines right here, and you can see that uh, also right along the front of this car right here. Now that's something where I would want to take more time to render this thing out. As an alternative to time, we also have this thing called iterations. 
Now, iterations is another similarity to iRay, but it's a little bit more ambiguous than time. When I say something's going to take five seconds to render, you know exactly what that means. But if I say something's going to take eight iterations, what does that really mean? Well, it, the way that it works with um, Quicksilver specifically, you can think back to these nitrous viewports. And as I showed you before with adaptive degradation, as soon as I release the cursor and I stop navigating, you can see that it does that progressive refinement and it gets better and better as you release the mouse. Well, that's exactly what this iteration or number of passes means. If I drop this iterations down to one pass, it's just going to do quite literally one pass of refinement for the look of this. So once again, it's collecting all these uh, images, putting it onto the video card, and there's our one pass. Uh, Quicksilver render again. It's not that great. The lighting is pretty is off. I can see some errors right down in here, but that's a one iteration. And I'm just showing you for uh, example's sake. You probably would never want to do it in animation or a still with one iteration. But if I even up, just up this to eight iterations or passes and go ahead and render this out, it's hardly going to take any longer to do. And I'll just point out that this last rendering took eight seconds. So once again, it's initializing. It's collecting the changes. Uh, putting it onto the video card, we'll do our render, and this one took 13 seconds. It looks much better. We have a higher visual quality with things like ambient occlusion and things that I'll dial into a little bit later. But the fact that we're using iterations is uh, very different in, in scope and in uh, mindset because you're not defining how long something takes, you're defining how long, I'm sorry, how good it looks. And this is the same thing with iRay is, Iterations is going to be how good it looks, not how long it takes. Another key thing about iterations is that iterations allows you to render out animations or images across multiple machines with a consistent look. And so this is going to be very, very important when you're doing animations. If I were up in here just doing single images and doing poster renderings or something like that, um, you know, that's one thing. But if I'm going to do an animation and especially do this on, you know, a machine or multiple machines, what I don't want to do is have one graphics card or one machine with a really nice high end graphics card rendering. Uh, let's use this example of time up here. Five seconds. I don't want to have a high end machine rendering five seconds of frame and then a low end graphics card rendering five seconds of frame because it will mean because of the uh, hardware acceleration that the graphics card, the higher end graphics card will do a better job in that five seconds. That's why, and that's one reason why, you'd wanna switch to this iterations. And this is gonna ensure that no matter how good your hardware is, it'll be a certain quality setting. And I can, this number isn't, uh, is ambiguous. It doesn't mean, you know, the higher the better, that's an obvious, I hope it, it goes without saying. But this the number doesn't need, mean to say like, I want 512 for final renderings and 128 or 64 for test renders or something like that. Generally speaking, you're going to have to do tests just like with other renderers to determine how much, you know, where is the fine line between quality versus performance and trade-off and so on. But again, this is a hardware renderer. It's happening on the GPU. 32 iterations is going to literally only take a couple of seconds. So if I were to just uh, render this, this single frame out, oops, and I'm rendering a uh, first frame. Well, actually, just to, I made a mistake here, but I'm actually going to show you this. This is how fast the, the, the Quicksilver render is. So I'm on frame six, uh, frame seven. I'm rendering an animation right now that's not very exciting. It's just a car uh, changing color. And I won't let this finish, but you can see I'm already on frame 10. I'm already on frame 11. And this is guessing that it's gonna be a 12 minute, anima 12 minute animation for this quality, or that quality rather, uh, at, let me cancel this out, I believe 64, I'm sorry, 32 iterations. So that's a great looking image for 32 iterations. As you can see, I've got nice anti-aliasing going on. I've got reflections in the viewport, or, or sorry, reflections in the render, uh, soft shadows over here. I've got real nice anti-aliasing. So this is gonna be you know, a really pr pretty good uh, setting for a very quick turnaround animation on this uh, particular file. Another important consideration when you're doing iterations for especially animation, is that you want to turn off things like uh, screen savers that are going to use the GPU. And whether whenever you're doing a quick silver rendering, if I were to just, for example, have another application open 
and use the video card a lot. Like for example, if I was in Photoshop and I was just moving around an image like this right here, just literally moving this viewport around is hitting the video card, which is gonna affect your performance of the render. Now, what's nice about hardware rendering is that it does free up the CPU and I can go often, quite often go do other tasks. But if I were to set up an animation and be using time, even on one machine, even if I was on this workstation where I'm sitting, and I said, render an animation of 100 frames and do five seconds of frame, well, or, or any amount of time for that matter, if I were to go hit render and then go do work in other applications and start moving around viewports like this, or even checking email or browsing the internet or something like that, and anything that hits the video card is gonna have a quality hit on the exact rendering that's going on at that moment. So it's worth considering uh, this iteration for a number of reasons, especially you know getting the exact same quality and a consistent look across multiple frames. To demonstrate this uh, quality consistency across multiple frames, I've jumped over into Autodesk Composite. And uh, I actually use this a lot as sort of my flipbook player as opposed to the RAM player in 3ds Max. Uh, one of the benefits, just as an aside to the topic at hand, is that Composite actually uses that disk caching. So you can play back a lot of clips and then come back the next day and these will still be cached. For example, if I were browsing a clip right here and I looked at this one, I can use what's called the mini player and actually just play this back at full screen. And you'll see that this is you know, a quick animation that I did using Quicksilver, and it's a nice uh, design visualization piece. This is coming from our friends over at Evermotion. I'd like to thank them for uh, providing the asset. But you can see it's just a nice, consistent rendering, and it's playing back uh, off the disk in real time. Well, one of the things that I don't like about this little mini player is that it doesn't have an option to uh, eliminate or ignore the alpha. Like in this particular example, there was a metal ray arch and design, or sorry, metal ray sky, sun and sky system in this scene, but you can't really see the sky because there's an alpha channel involved. So one little tip and trick that I do is I sometimes create a composite. You can see here's that same exact uh, animation, but then I put an alpha, a drop alpha tool on here. And in composite, what you do is just bring up the gate UI, swipe over to tools, go to the alpha channel category of tools, and then the tool that you want to bring out is just called drop alpha. So you can wire this in to any clip. And what I've done ahead of time is gone through and cached these different clips out. So all of these drop alpha nodes are really doing is just eliminating so that I can see the entire back plate and not just the uh, rendered pixels without the alpha channel. So getting back to the action here, this is an example, uh, this is a good example of what you don't want. And if I play this back, you can see that there, we're getting a lot of flickering. This is not a uh, final gather flicker as it often would be the case with something like uh, bad settings in Mental Ray. But you can see that this Quicksilver rendering, this particular file here, I've uh, annotated it to be ca called 10 seconds. So this was using a render value of time as opposed to iterations. And once again, if we look at this, and I hope you can see that that flickering is quite uh, pronounced. In fact, if I just frame by frame on a few of these, notice how the indirect illumination off of that teapot and around the ground or the grass and so on is very inconsistent from frame to frame. The robot, the gold on the robot looks pretty good. The fence looks pretty good, but you just, you know, when, it, when you play this back, you see obvious inconsistencies, and this is what you don't want to have. <clears throat> this is directly related uh, to indirect illumination, which I'll be talking about a little bit. This is not the same thing as indirect illumination with Metal Ray or uh, iRay or any other renderer for that matter. It's kind of a cheat on hardware, but it does do a decent fake of bouncing around light. Now again, just to get back to the topic of, at, of time versus iteration, this is an example of what you don't want with all that flicker. If I jump to this example here and play it back, you can see that I've got a much more consistent uh, look across this, and this is a iteration of 32. And I don't know if this is gonna show on the capture software, but there is still a little bit of flickering going on in here. It's not nearly as bad, but we jumped to 32 iterations, which in my opinion is still a fairly low number of iterations. And then this next example is 128 iterations. So now we're starting to look at this animation and there's no flickering involved. There's a consistency across all the images and we get a nice, you know, worthwhile production render. This could be great for broadcast design or a kids television show or inver inverts, or, sorry, inserts, you know, in uh, non-broadcast pieces or whatever you want to do. Um, looking at more of a design visualization piece, this is one where we were rendering with one minute per frame, uh, a little bit longer, you know, to do indirect illumination. And as I play this back, once again, you'll see this inconsistency across the frames because we didn't use iterations. Even at one minute a frame, and I'll draw your attention to the bottom of this uh, glass tube here, 
as this caches and plays back from memory, let me just even focus on these beginning frames here, you can see that there's that inconsistent look right through here. And it's, it's basically uh, due to indirect illumination. But once again, if that plays back, you're going to get this really noticeable flickering. Well, if I switch that to an iteration count and play our back our animation, here once again is our nice smooth camera move across our Evermotion model. But we have a nice consistent render across all of the Quicksilver frames. And these renders, in fact, were done on two different machines with two video cards. So I wanted to stress and reemphasize the fact that if you are using, even if you're only using one machine, but if you are using more than one machine especially, you're definitely going to want to take advantage of the iteration as opposed to time setting for doing uh, animation rendering with Quicksilver. Most people watching should be familiar with this uh, little window up here, the Windows Task Manager, obviously used for monitoring the CPU usage as well as the memory in your computer. However, I'd like to also talk about uh, two similar applications. These are not Autodesk products and they're not part of 3ds Max. Uh, one of them is called Tech Power Ups GPU-Z is the name of the application. And the other one is EVGA Precision and that's for uh, graphics tuning. If I bring up the websites right here, so let me uh, get over here. Uh, the, so the first is Tech Power Ups GPU Z, and I'll be providing these links, but it's pretty uh, straightforward. You can just even Google GPU Z. This is one application, and then unrelated to that is just another option here called EVGA Precision, and you can see down here I've got you know some screenshots. Both of these are free and available for download. Um, both of these support uh, different graphics cards. Right here, you can see that I have a little NVIDIA uh, logo right there. That's actually just identifying the video card in my system. But it does support AMD, uh, also known as previously known as ATI video cards. If I tab over here in GPU-Z to sensors, this is what I'm after right here is memory used and GPU load. And that's exactly the same thing as using the Windows Task Manager. So here's... Uh, CPU usage and memory of the heart of the motherboard and this is GPU load and memory on the video card likewise over here you can see GPU usage um, on the precision monitor so if I go ahead and bring up uh, 3ds max one of the things that I can do is I've got Quicksilver set up to render I'm gonna actually change this to 30 seconds just to give it a little bit longer render and um, let's maybe render a nice high-definition uh, 1080p video frame I'm going to start that to render and immediately um, pop over to these uh, monitors. And uh, I'm going to bring both of them up. And you can see this will happen pretty quick because it's going to be going uh, on hardware. But you can see that the GPU usage is being reported by both of these applications. So you can see that you know our Quicksilver rendering is happening. And we're getting the ability to monitor the use of the video card as it uh, you know chugs along on this render. So as soon as we're going to let this go, so we're at, you know, and you can see both of these are reporting the same usage on the, on the uh, GPU load. And you can see again, that you can see that here and here. And now that it's finished the rendering, it should just drop back down to zero and our video card is now freed up. Uh, another thing I forgot to mention actually, just showing this full 1080p frame, uh, I should have mentioned this a little bit earlier, but when we were talking about uh, Quicksilver being an actual true renderer in 3ds Max, one more advantage of having a true renderer as opposed to just doing a make preview is that you can render um, images that are higher than the resolution of your viewport. So in this case, I have a full 1080p. You know, there's our nice uh, any aliasing on hardware and everything looks great. And, you know, this might be uh, useful for doing something like a kid's animation for a television show or something like that. So... One of the things to just remember is that you can monitor your GPU using several different applications. These two are just free. They're out there. I use them quite often, uh, both with iRay and with Quicksilver. So that's, you know, taking advantage of the hardware and, and monitoring that hardware as, you're, uh, as you are taking advantage of it. One more thing as an aside to mention, uh, if I come over here into Tech Power Ups GPU Z, there's this CUDA architecture that is specific to NVIDIA graphics cards. And this is one area where iRay and Quicksilver uh, differ quite a bit, is that iRay is hardware accelerated by CUDA and Quicksilver is hardware accelerated by DirectX using that uh, shader model 3.0 or later. So to be clear about this, Quicksilver requires shader model 3.0 or later. However, iRay does not require CUDA. Uh, 
the the uh, this is a bit of a misnomer uh, out there is that iRay is not only a hardware renderer. If you do not have a CUDA enabled NVIDIA video card, you can still use iRay, but it won't be hardware accelerated. So if you're using uh, something that doesn't have CUDA or maybe a non non NVIDIA video card, that's a mouthful then you still can use iRay and take advantage of its simplicity and everything like that, but you won't be hardware accelerating it. So that's just a little uh, side note there of how um, both I or iRay and Quicksilver can be very different. They both take advantage of the GPU to render, and they both can be monitored using these different applications, but iRay requires CUDA for hardware acceleration, and Quicksilver requires Shader Model 3.0, as we saw earlier. Another similarity between Quicksilver and iRay is that they're both very simple renderers to set up. Here you can see I've got the uh, rollout for all of the rendering options within Quicksilver. And as we saw already, we've got time and iterations. I'm going to close that up because we've already discussed that. And likewise, I'm going to uh, close up the hardware cache because we've already discussed that. And that leaves you with very little to actually deal with. Uh, and that can be a good and a bad thing. Uh, if you want ultimate control over your renders, obviously uh, the included renderer called Mental Ray is a great option within 3ds Max. But going back to iRay and Quicksilver being very simple to set up, one of the advantages of both of those renderers is that for people that aren't full-time 3ds Max users who just want to make a pretty picture and get it out fast, or an animation for that matter, iRay is going to be perfect for doing photorealistic work and Quicksilver will be ideal for doing that kind of work when you want semi-realistic or non-photorealistic work like technical illustration or uh, you know, semi-realistic work. Both of them obviously accelerated on the GPU as we have seen, but they're very simple to set up and that's uh, very worthwhile to mention. Another thing, a little tip and trick here is I go into the materials and talk about some similarities here. Uh, a tip and trick that I'm going to do is switch over to the common tab of the renderer. <clears throat> Excuse me. And under production renderer, you can see we're set up for Quicksilver. But what I'm going to do is unlock this and set up the material editor to actually use Metal Ray. I find that when I'm using Quicksilver, the Metal Ray renderer for the actual material sample slots right here, these sample spheres, is going to be a little bit faster, potentially quite a bit faster depending on your scene. So that's my first little uh, tip and trick as far as material editing goes. I'm going to dismiss this dialog now and start talking a little bit about uh, the materials themselves. So in the scene here you can see we've got our gold on our robot. Uh, this is the chrome of the teapots. But one of the things that uh, you'll notice is that I'm using the arch and design shader. If I flip over to the help files right here, and once again, uh, this is just the root level help file for Quicksilver. I'm at rendering, renderers, Quicksilver hardware renderer. So I'm at the root of the actual Quicksilver help file. And you'll come down here. I'm not going to read through all this because you can obviously do that on your own time. But here you can see where it says supported materials and map types and shaders. Uh, also additional capabilities. I'll get to render elements a little bit later. But I want to focus up here on the arch and design material as well as Autodesk materials. So the arch and design shader, I've opened up the help file for that right here. If you haven't checked this out, even if you've been using the Arch and Design Shader for some time, I highly encourage checking this thing out. Uh, this help file is really phenomenal. And then one more that's worth printing out or just taking a look at later is in the help uh, reference help files for 3ds Max. If you come down under um, Arch and Design, uh, where are we here? Under Arch and Design, that's quite a list. Well, what I'm looking for is under Arch and Design is this Tips and Tricks. You can see right here, I'm, I'm already there. Um, this Tips and Tricks is really worthwhile reading about if you're, even if you're experienced using the Arch and Design shader. So, <clears throat> excuse me, going back to the help files over here for the actual Quicksilver renderer, you'll notice once again we have Arch and Design and Autodesk Materials. Arch and Design and Autodesk Materials are actually very similar. In fact, the Autodesk Material Library is a subset of the Arch and Design Material. And if you look at the Autodesk Materials, and I open that up, if you're not familiar with what these are, this is a library of over 1,200 uh, photorealistic materials that can be used with Mental Ray, iRay, and Quicksilver. And that's going to be also true of the Arch and Design Shader. So both of these options, the Arch and Design Shader and the Autodesk Material Library are excellent options if you're using any of the included renderers with, within 3ds Max except the Scanline Renderer. Let me go back over to this help file. 
so Arch and Design and Autodesk Materials. If you're not familiar with the Autodesk Material Library, I'm going to just uh, come over and create a new material, or as if I were going to create a new material. If I go browse out the materials in this scene, here you can see I've got Mental Ray quickly rendering out these sample spheres. I'm just going to close up this, uh, these rollouts here and focus right for a second on the Autodesk Material Library. If you're not, again, if you're not familiar with this, it's over 1,200 new uh, shaders that are included, and they're all uh, photometrically accurate. So these are going to be excellent for use with Metal Ray, Quicksilver, and iRay. And another thing that's uh, advantageous here, a moment ago I was saying if, if people aren't full-time users of 3ds Max, that both iRay and Quicksilver are excellent options. This is another big reason for that is because, say for example, I'm in AutoCAD or Inventor or Revit, also products outside of the media and entertainment family, but Autodesk products that are very popular worldwide. Uh, if you export data from those applications into 3ds Max, those models all come over with this Autodesk material library. So this can be ad advantageous to people uh, using external applications such as uh, Inventor, Revit, and AutoCAD and bringing in data to 3ds Max or Max Design for a quick uh, animation previews or photorealistic rendering. So these Autodesk material uh, libraries are really great and they're also uh, phenomenal for people that aren't shader wizards and just want to have a quick setup for something like some clear, glean, clear green glass. Again, very simple, it uses real world uh, terminology and they're very easy to set up. I like to use this Arch and Design shader as my workhorse for about everything I do with the exception of the scanline renderer. Now, having said that, if I jump over to the help files again and, s and look at the supported materials for Quicksilver, I've been talking about Arch and Design and the subset of Autodesk materials. The standard old school material is in fact supported. So between the Arch and Design material and the standard material, that's pretty much everything that you need to get going with about any renderer. And just to reiterate, standard material is gonna be supported by any renderer at all but it's not physically based, which is what iRay kind of likes. The Arch and Design material is really my go-to shader for everything other than scanline work. Now, jumping about this, uh, or jumping down here about the Arch and Design, there are some restrictions here. For example, on the Arch and Design material, the Quicksilver renderer ignores these settings, self-illumination and round corners. Now, if you're not familiar with those, I highly encourage you to check out the help files. For time's sake, I'm not gonna go into those. Those are just, uh, I'll just show you where they are. Um, we have some self-illumination effects right here to make an object glow. And we also have special effects for round corners, which is a way to fake, um, well, fake round corners on a square edge. For example, right here, you might want a round corner using iRay or the Mental Ray rendering engine. But that round corner is not going to be supported by Quicksilver. Um, talking about this... Uh, this um, limitation that self-illumination doesn't work. I actually get around that very easily. If you'll notice this character's eyes, I'm gonna do a quick rendering right here and just kind of knock this out on the Quicksilver renderer. Once again, compiling the shaders on the video card. I'm one third done, uh, about half done, three quarters done or two, two thirds done. Anyway, you get the idea and we got an image. You'll notice that this character's eyes are pretty dark one of the things that I can do is come over here to his eyeball material, and this is actually a standard shader. And I really like the standard shader for, if, for a lot of reasons, but the self-illumination is a very easy value to just say, like, this is 100% self-illuminated, and now the character's eyes are going to have the sort of a backlighting effect. So even though the Arch and Design shader doesn't support self-illumination on the Quicksilver hardware renderer, there's a very simple workaround that you just use the standard shader with self-illumination, and it is going to be supported. You can already see his eyes are completely 100% self-illuminated now. 100% might be a little extreme, but you get the idea that we can in fact make objects glow using this shader. So that's going to be worthwhile to uh, know that within the help files is a great uh, list of things that are supported. Um, real quick, uh, just to go through, I'm not going to go through this any more in depth, but multi-sub object is definitely supported and that's key to using this. And then uh, just some map restrictions here. I basically go nuts with bitmaps as texture maps throughout my scene. I also use gradient ramps, uh, uh, or sorry, gradient maps, but the gradient ramp map is not supported. So here's some things that are not supported um, within the actual renderer. So I, I highly encourage you to check out this, uh, this dialogue of what is and is not supported. But to uh, summarize, the Arch and Design shader is something that every renderer except Scanline really, really likes. And if you're not using this Arch and Design shader 
I, I highly encourage you to check it out for Metal Ray, iRay, and Quicksilver rendering. As I said earlier, the basics of the Quicksilver renderer are very uh, limited and in a good way. That It's nice for simple setups and very quick and easy use. Uh, I'm going to skip the description of what a shadow is. I hope most of you know what a shadow is. But here you can see that what you've got options for enabling things like ambient occlusion. Now, a lot of you probably know what ambient occlusion is. But here you can see we've only got two controls of an intensity or fade, which is kind of like the quantity of it. And then the radius. The radius right here is in uh, default system units. And so if it just says 2.0 and you're not exactly sure what that is, you just want to check your uh, unit setup. Right now I'm working with uh, one unit equals one inch as my system units uh, setup. And that is the default in 3ds Max. And then my display units, I'm using feet with fractional inches. A little tip and trick that I always like to do to kind of spot check that I'm working to, true to scale is just to create a native max uh, cube. And I'm just going to do this over in the right viewport or the front viewport here. I'm just checking that it's about as tall as my scene. And it's showing me that it's one foot tall. So I do know that this scene is modeled to scale. I'm going to go ahead and delete that cube. So we've got our scene set up to scale. And then if we look back at our render dialog, what this is going to mean for ambient occlusion is that our radius, this is how far out it's going to calculate our ambient occlusion. So if I said 12 right here, that's going to be 12 inches, and in this case, one foot of our scene. Well, that might be a little bit wide for a scene this small. So I might want to bring it down to a radius of, say, 2 inches. And then if I go ahead and hit render on this, you're going to see our Quicksilver rendering kind of compile. There it goes onto the graphics card. And then one of the things that I like to do, especially when I'm learning a, a new renderer like this, I'm just going to come up under the RAM player and use this button right here to open up the last rendering into channel A. So this is a rendering with ambient occlusion. And if I just turn off ambient occlusion and uh, knock off another renderer to Quicksilver, it's going to process that out. I'll kill that. And then in the, in the RAM player channel B, I'm going to load that in. So you can see right now this is with and without ambient occlusion. And as you know, it's a subtle difference. And depending on your, and I'm kind of focusing maybe at the bottom of the shoe there, Depending on your scene and especially the scale of your scene, ambient occlusion is going to add that realism of you know weight or uh, objects kind of connecting to the ground. So I'm going to go ahead and leave that on. I might widen that out to say four inches. Indirect illumination as I turn this on, this is going to be your bounce lighting. Now this is a cheat and it's not true global illumination or final gather or anything like that. It's a very simple setup. And once again, we've got an amount or multiplier. And then the most important thing, in my opinion, is the sample distribution area. Here it's a little more clear because we, it is showing the display units. So we could say, how far out do we want to bounce light around? And this scene, again, it's a pretty small scene, about three feet you know, across. So we might want to say a two foot sample distribution. And I'll go ahead and render that out. Remember that our previous ambient occlusion render was in uh, the B frame buffer. So now we're getting a little bit of indirect illumination. And I'm going to load that into our virtual frame buffer A to com keep kind of comparing with in building up here. So we've got a little bit of bounce lighting now mo happening around in our scene. I'll minimize that. And then reflections. Reflections is a pretty straightforward thing. If I just enable reflections, you'll see uh, that we've got some options here for include, material ID, and object ID. Well, if I pop over to the help files, once again, you can see that I go to the, I'm going to go to the Quicksilver reflections rollout. And it says right here, enabling reflections enables static reflections only. To see dynamic reflections on an object, you must explicitly include it by using the subcontrols. And all that really means is that you can say selectively, if I have a dynamic object, say that it was going to be animated or I want you know, a, a really dynamic reflection on it, I could select that object and then come into the include, exclude, and use this. This is the exact same dialog as include, exclude for lights. And in this case, it's going to be for doing a reflection pass. So I'm just going to enable it globally in my scene. And once again, I'll just knock off a very quick rendering. Now here you're going to see the most dramatic change right over here on this part of the shoe right over here, because it is, in fact, an arch and design shader. It's very reflective. I'll once again bring up my RAM player and load this into, uh, let's see, channel B. So now we're starting to see a real dynamic effect, a lot of reflections going on on that shoe, the before and after. So really nice hardware rendered reflections on that. And then lastly, depth of field. Depth of field is uh, really kind of interesting. This is another similarity to iRay is that enabling depth of field does not add render time. Uh, and I'm going to immediately repeat that because <laughs> it's kind of strange. Depth of field does not add render time. Now, having said that, 
don't go too nuts using depth of field because uh, it's one of those, it's like the new lens flare in my book that just because you have it doesn't mean you should go uh, wild using it. So the way that this works is not, not too tricky, but it's not quite obvious. Here you can see that depth of field is in fact enabled, but what I have to do is come down to the actual camera itself and I'm gonna select my camera in my scene and I'm gonna come over to the uh, modifier stack or the modifier panel. And this multi-pass camera effect is kind of, the controls for this are kind of piggybacked. What, what I mean by that is if I don't have that enabled and went ahead, even though my scene is set up to use depth of field here and I hit render, I'm not gonna get a depth of field because that multi-pass effect isn't enabled for this, the camera that I'm rendering out of, okay? So once again, if I select that camera and let me just make room here and I enable a multi-pass camera effect this is worth reading up on the motion blur and depth of field are what are called multi-pass camera effects and these have been around in Max for a number of years but what we're looking for is depth of field mental ray and this this one even though it says mental ray this is the one that's used for eye ray as well as quicksilver when you enable this depth of field so it's a two-step process you have to enable it globally here and then you enable it locally per camera so now that I have it enabled, what I can do is go ahead and render this out. And I am going to get, in fact, a depth of field. And you'll probably notice it back here uh, where it's going to be a little bit blurry on that back edge. So we've blurred out the back edge of our box a little bit. And then the last control for depth of field down here is depth of field parameters. Now you'll notice if this dialog isn't right here, and once again, my camera is selected. If I have multi-pass camera effects set to this the wrong depth of field, I won't have the option for the f-stops in there. If I go down to the depth of field for mental ray, whoops, uh, depth of field mental ray, now I've got the depth of field parameters of f-stop. And you don't really need a photography background. This is, in fact, related to real-world photography. But fundamentally speaking, the higher you go, so let's say if I do an f-stop of 10, that's going to be a very subtle, if, if at all, depth of field effect. Uh, you know, upwards of 10, uh, above eight or above is probably going to be not much blur, but it'll give you some realism as if you're doing photography. I'm going to dial this down extreme amount to like an F1, and you don't have to use real photography values there. Basically, what I'm getting at is the, lo the lower this value, the more blurry you'll be. Now, you can see here, I'm, I'm doing quick renders right now, and I've got some artifacts going on right here. That's because I've set this renderer up to only be doing 32 iterations. And once I've got the depth of field set up the way that I like it, maybe I wanna split the difference and go to 1.5. And then I might crank this up to like 128 or, or more to get a production quality render. So that's gonna be the way that you get through um, uh, setting up your depth of field. It's a two-step process. The rest of the renderer is uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, so there we go, we've got our uh, ambient occlusion, depth of field, indirect illumination, um, what else we got? <laughs> Reflections and all of that enabled and we're still rendering HD frames in uh, 11 seconds that look pretty darn good. So that's the basics of the renderer and now I'm going to move on to talking about the non-photorealistic styles available to Quicksilver. As was discussed earlier, these nitrous viewports are going to be tied to the Quicksilver hardware renderer. And one thing I've been kind of glazing over and that I'd like to get to now is talking about these stylized viewports. Uh, like, for example, if I just change to ink, you can see that right away we get this uh, sort of non-photorealistic or almost cartoon or technical illustration. You can call this a lot of different things, but you can see that that's actually right in the viewport. And if I uh, switch out to uh, another view, you can see that this is, in fact, you know, a shader that's happening right on the graphics card. I'm not doing any animation right now. I'm just navigating around my typical uh, 3DS Max scene. And you can see that I can change to a couple of different ones. If I go to graphite mode here, you'll see that this one looks like a, a, literally a pencil. And it actually kind of swims through a texture map, if you will, of, of that pencil look. So this is a nice black and white one. I will take the time to go through these very briefly here. Colored pencil is exactly the same thing as graphite, except obviously, hence the name colored. It has a colored look to it. And it does support the texture maps that are applied in this scene, which is very important. Uh, these are going to be useful for a lot of different things. Uh, switching now to the ink one, this is just a, a sort of a black and white um, line art. And then there's uh, colored ink, which is one of my favorites. Uh, colored ink, you can see supports transparency and texture maps in the viewport and, uh, and so on. 
Uh, and once again, these are going to be useful for a lot of different things. You could use these for architectural visualizations that don't need to be photo real. These could be a lot of uh, product design and uh, instructional videos of how a machine might work, for example, or even kids' animations for cartoon type things. This one's called acrylic, which is an, another one of my favorites. Uh, switching over here to uh, stylized pastel. These last two have sort of a paper feel to them. Actually, you know, in the viewport, you can see that the background actually has a sort of a textured pebbled effect, like if it was uh, pastel on paper. And then lastly, we can switch over to this one called Tech, which is another one of my favorite ones. Uh, uh, tech and Acrylic are probably my two favorites. It's a personal choice, but they're very, um, you know, cartoony or technical illustration and give you that really fine control. So once again, I can change that at the viewport level. And if I bring up the Quicksilver renderer controls, you can see that I do have rendering level. And these are going to be consistent with the um, Nitrous viewports. So if I change this, to, uh, I'm in technical, and I change this over to tech, you still know that, notice that I have amp options for things like ambient occlusion and indirect illumination and so on. But if I just change this over to, uh, let's just do a 10-second uh, render. Whoops, not 210, but a 10-second render. And I'll go ahead and knock that off. It might look a little bit different in the viewport because, well, and that's a previous render that I did uh, prior to the recording. It looks very different in the viewport. Uh, what we're, co we're compiling our shaders right now. Um, what I was going to say was it might look a little bit different than the viewport version or the nitrous version of these shaders because you have the option to enable things like reflections and indirect illumination and ambient occlusion. So these are going to be something to definitely uh, you want to play with and uh, you know try a lot of tests with these. One of the things that I highly recommend with these uh, non-photorealistic shaders or stylized shaders, as you might be uh, might hear them called is uh, to you know submit these to your render queue. Remember long before in the uh, session I talked about even if you only have one machine, take advantage of network rendering. And this is where you might set up a render or eight different renders according to these eight different looks and have them all go overnight and take about an hour each. So in the morning you could have a finished uh, you know set of animations and lots of different looks to uh, explore with this. As you might imagine, switching between these uh, viewport styles, uh, stylized here, like for example, going over to acrylic and kind of seeing what you like in the viewport and then coming over here and having to match it, that can get a little bit tedious. So the next uh, little bit here is a tip and trick, or not so much a tip and trick, but just a favor from our good friend uh, Bobo from Bobo Land and Bobo fame in 3DS Max world. This is called the NPR Explorer, and I've already got it installed here. I'm going to provide links to this on my blog at area.autodesk.com. And uh, this is, I'm going to just evoke this uh, dialogue right here. What this thing does is the, the Nitrous NPR settings for viewports, Quicksilver, or my personal favorite, both. So by clicking this right here, you're basically matching the Nitrous viewport styles that you would set up here with the settings right over here in the visual style and appearance for Quicksilver. So you'll see that if I just drop this out and choose tech, it changed both in both places and we can see that in the viewport. It also offers up some options that aren't available anywhere else and God love Bobo for ha handing this stuff out for free. My favorite thing here is if you look at this large value here, 14 for normal edge multiplier, if I drop this down, it might be hard to see in the, in the recording, but the uh, cartoon outline or the technical outline around this character has been uh, dramatically reduced. And if I just drop this up all the way, let's do 99999, I forget what the maximum value is, say 50, you can see that the thickness around all these uh, adjusts accordingly. So I can, I can control things like the dark levels, which is basically kind of like a built-in color corrector into the tool. And I'll, you know, let you, I'll provide this to you uh, on the blog and let you play with the specifics of this. But just to reiterate the importance of this, what it's doing is letting you switch both the Quicksilver hardware renderer and the Nitrous viewports to match. So if I say colored pencil, it's going to flip both of these to colored pencil. It'll take a second. It's compiling the shaders on the video card. And then once we get the, both the viewport and the uh, uh, visual style and appearance set up for Quicksilver, we can go ahead and pop off a render. So that's going to be a really nice script, especially if you're doing things like technical illustration or cartoon using this uh, Quicksilver renderer. 
As I mentioned, one of the things I like to do is queue up a lot of uh, animations to Backburner for network rendering, even again on one machine. It's the, taking advantage of a queue. And here you can see I've just got these, uh, this character rendered out uh, using several different of the NPR styles. And as, if I look at this uh, colored pencil, and just I'm piping that once again into the drop alpha for the same reason I talked about earlier, so you can see the entire uh, you know, backplate with the, uh, without the alpha channel applied. Uh, you know, here you can see that I'm getting our colored pencil, and I just want to see what things might look like in motion. Again, I, I, I pretty much often think in terms of animation and not still rendering. So those of you that are going to take advantage of Quicksilver for animation purposes, this might be something to consider. Uh, I even, uh, you know, do like looking at the realistic mode. This is not one of the non-photorealistic styles. This is just the nitrous realistic look. Uh, you know, the uh, actual full off nitrous look, but we've added things like ambient occlusion. Uh, here's once again our technical. I won't go through all these, but I just wanted to show you that you can take advantage of Autodesk Composite to kind of loop these things and cast them to disk. So you could render multiple animations overnight using Quicksilver and then take a look at them all, you know, in the morning uh, using this uh, playback feature. Another powerful feature of Quicksilver is the fact that it has render elements, and that isn't the case with when you make a preview using the viewport. If I come over to render elements and say add, as you commonly do with other renderers, you can see that the list isn't as extensive as something like Metal Ray, but I'm going to show you some tips and tricks on how to get a few more out of this, as well as some uh, workflows that you can do with Autodesk Composite and some tricks that you can do with the ones that are included. I've already added them here. Alpha channel is pretty self-explanatory. It's just a matte, black and white matte pass for your uh, the alpha channel of your scene. Basically, anywhere there's geometry will be uh, white, and everything that is uh, just the void of 3ds Max's you know nothingness is black. It's the it's an alpha channel of your entire scene. Uh, material ID is going to be something with no options. If you're not familiar with what material ID is, if I open up the material editor. What material ID allows you to do is this, this number right here. So if I have a specific material selected, I can assign up to 16 different materials. Um, really what that is is 15. If everything in the scene by default has a material ID of zero, um, what you're going to do is kind of leave that one alone and then use these other 15 for special effects. So if you wanted to have something like all the bleachers in this scene were using the standard, uh, I shouldn't say a standard, but a common material, and you wanted to do like a color correction effect in, in composite or another uh, compositing application, you could do that very easily by creating a matte channel ID and then rendering, I'm sorry, a material ID and then rendering a material ID render element. One of the things that's really important about material IDs, you don't get that many of them, so I say use them sparingly. Um, they can be, they can work at the sub-object level, and that's very, very important and very powerful that they can work at the sub-object level. So, say for example, I wanted just the front of this car done. That's going to be something that you could do with a multi-sub-object and have two versions of the material in itself, and only one of them has a specific material ID to isolate those uh, polygons. So, material ID is going to be has no options. But it's going to be very powerful to use, uh, you know, up to 15 of these things at at the object level or at the sub-object level. Object ID, on the other hand, you can have up to 65,533 of these. I think 65,535. Sorry, <laughs> a lot of them. Let's just put it that way. What you do here is select one or more objects, go to Object Properties, and you can set the uh, G buffer object ID right here. And this would likewise be if you wanted to do chairs in a stadium or maybe all four tires on this car or something like that. Object ID, the fundamental uh, caveat there is that it is a mat that's created for the entire object and does not work at the sub-object level. So that's just, you know, the material ID, you get 15 of them and they can work at the sub-object level. Object ID, you have 65,000 of them, and you can work at the object level. And these are worth mixing and matching. Now, one thing about Object ID that I'll get to in a moment is that you can work with render color based on Object ID or Object Color. What Object Color does is instead of using the, uh, once again, I'm going to show you the, what an Object ID is, Object Properties, this is where you set up Object ID for one or more selected objects. However, as an alternative to that, and this is where I get into a kind of a tip and trick here, if I look at the wireframe of this scene, 
Um, you can see that the, the color of the car is, uh, when it's not selected, is yellow. This tire is green. Uh, something over here, the bleachers is purple, and so on. What this is, is the actual object color right over here. So I could say, let's take uh, the tires in this car and give them a common object color and I could control them. Now the object color doesn't really matter. It's not gonna be a something that renders once a material is applied. But you could say, you know, all these four tires have a green common color at the object level. And this might be a little bit more useful in the viewport because you can kind of see this. Now again, if I bring up the renderer dialog, you're gonna have under render elements the option for object ID to use that object color. Now my tip and trick here, and I'm gonna include this script. It's a very simple script. Um, if I select everything in my scene and run this random wireframe color script, what it does is it randomizes the color of selected objects. And I'm going to do this to the entire scene. So I'm just going to hit that button once. And then you can see that everything in my scene has a, uh, has a completely random value. What that's going to mean is, and this is almost like back in the days of, uh, you know, using the RPF file format with combustion, is that this is basically a G-buffer object ID. Instead of material ID or object ID, it's what used to be called a render node ID, whereas a ma wherein a mask is created for every single object. So every single object that has a different color will have a different mask. Z depth is one that's pretty self-explanatory. I think most people know by now it's a grayscale value that represents depth. Uh, the options for this uh, include uh, setting a minimum and maximum. I like to use this update when I'm doing test renders, but I typically manually set this based on real world units using the camera to determine how far into the scene with, of depth we want to calculate. An important thing to remember with render elements is that they do uh, often require an alpha channel. As you, some of you may know, I'm very big fan of rendering always with an alpha channel to a file format that supports an alpha channel. In this case, I would be going to PNG with a 48-bit color output, and that's gonna give me uh, color sliders from zero to 65,000 as opposed to zero to 255 as you would get in an 8-bit image. Uh, another way to call that would be 16-bit integer uh, as opposed to 16-bit half float for the PNG. OpenEXR is another great example of a file format. However, the Quicksilver hardware renderer does not support, support floating point output. So it doesn't support high dynamic range uh, output. You can have high dynamic range images coming in for things like the environment map and things like that, but it doesn't support HDR output. So PNG 16-bit uh, integer, which is also known as 48-bit PNGs, uh, is a great option uh, and definitely want to embed an alpha channel with that. If I jump over into Autodesk Composite, here you can see we've got our car uh, rendered out. And let's, I'm gonna hit the six hotkey to show the output of every node that I've got selected. And some of the tips and tricks I'm gonna show you here, uh, I'll start with this one uh, with Z-Depth. Here's the Z-Depth pass that we rendered out of our scene. Uh, one of the tools that I like to do is this color correct histogram. And uh, once again, it's over color correct CC histo. This histogram, whoops, sorry, this one right here, gives you the ability to clamp color and it kind of gives me the ability in real time to push what is considered near and far in my Z depth. So this is gonna be a nice trick when you're doing things like a depth of field comp and you can see that I can clamp the near and far values of my Z depth pass to really control where is that depth of field effect gonna be taking place. So I can maybe just have the back of the car uh, going into black a little bit more than I did out of the native renderer. Uh, this invert is just going to flip-flop that effect because I'm popping this into a blur node. So the blur node right here, if I go to uh, filtering, blur, and just drag and drop that out. That's what I've done right here. The blur node, I'm not using the blur of you know the, the entire image. This, is, this would be a Gaussian blur that affects the entire image. I'm going to put that back down to zero because it's not what I'm after. What I'm after is a modulation blur. And so you can see here if I zoom in, what I've done is taken the grayscale value of our Z depth and I've piped it into a modulation image. And the primary input to our blur is in fact the beauty pass. So here's our beauty pass and we've got a blur happening to it that is a modulation blur. So here's the primary blur that would be blurring the entire image. That's not what we wanna do. We wanna blur with modulation and it's based on our Z depth. So if I were to crank this up to say five, you'll notice that the back of the car is gonna get a lot more depth of field. Now, you might be asking yourself, why would I do depth of field in composite when depth of field doesn't cost me any more to do in Quicksilver? 
And it's really just about having options. I'm not saying that I always do depth of field in compositing, especially in the case with Quicksilver when you're often using it in tandem. I might be doing a project, for example, in Mental Ray as my final output renderer, but I'm using Quicksilver along the way to just do test renderings and that kind of thing. So you might want to just do an in-camera depth of field if you're using Quicksilver. But this is just another way to kind of uh, opt for doing depth of field effects uh, maybe after the fact in compositing. So that's a nice little tip and trick with some Z-Depth. Uh, moving up here, what we've got is our beauty pass of the car itself. And right now what I'm doing right here is color correcting just the car. And I'm, I'm doing this in an extreme example here. As if I grab this around, you can see that I'm you know, tinting the car different colors. The way that I did that was uh, similar to the workflow that was back from uh, using the RPF file format with something like Autodesk Combustion. But what I'm doing here is taking this pass and piping it into a keyer. So the keyer, in this case, I'm using a diamond keyer because it's very simple. And what I've done is I'm just using the keyer to isolate a certain pixel value. And I'm, I, to, uh, if I just reset this, for example, what I can do is to a brand new diamond keyer, and let me show you where that is, by the way, under the keying category of tools, there's just a tool called diamond keyer. So I can apply the diamond keyer to one of those uh, matte passes, a, a material ID or an object ID or a matte pass. And then when I just click the middle button here for tolerance and pick the car, what it's done is keyed out that car and created an alpha channel. And then I'm going to take the output of that alpha channel as an input to the color corrector. And what that is is a masking input. So if I have the color corrector selected here, you can see all the great controls from the Academy Award winning color corrector. But if I pop over to the masking tab, this allows me to control what is the mask input. And is it a red, green, or blue channel? Or in this case, the alpha is what I've created using that keyer. And here you can see I could flip flop it or invert it. So I'm color correcting everything except the math that's coming in. And this is going to be really great. And this is where you can take advantage of that object ID. And here's, uh, you know, it's not just a black and white image, but think about all the mats that are in this particular uh, clip right here. So I'll show you this workflow once again because it's maybe new to some people out there. If I have this uh, particular uh, beauty pass rendered out of Quicksilver, I can come over and do color correction. And by the way, I'm just doing color correction here because it's a very obvious example. This is uh, this masking input uh, that we're about to do can be used for anything, uh, blurs, you know, gr adding grain and, and all kinds of stuff. So if I if I uh, say let's color correct this image. Once again, I'm going to do a really extreme example and just say, like, make everything blue and really bright. So I'm intentionally kind of washing this image out. So it's a very extreme example. I'll reset it in a second. Then what I can do down here is I want to apply a diamond keyer, and I can just pick any object in my scene to create that mat. And then the alpha channel that's created is going to be output into our color corrector. And so you can see here, everything in this scene is now being affected except that tire. Well, if I just want to flip that, I can go to the masking tab and invert it. So now only our tire is getting that crazy color correction. Another tip and trick here. So if I wanted to look at this in context, what I can do is hold down the, a number key. You have up to four context points in composite. I'm going to hold down the one key and just click this node right here to set a context point. And then I'm going to hover my cursor over this viewport right here and tap the letter one. So what's happening is, or another way to do that, if I swipe down through the gate UI and go to the player options over this, you can see here I'm looking at the context point of one. And I can have up to four of these. And these are the hotkeys one, two, three, and four. So back to the action. Here we are. We're looking at this, the output of this node right now. But I can go back and and in the diamond keyer, I can pick on different objects. So notice right now it's the tire. If I pick the car, the car turns light blue. If I pick the ground over here, the ground turns light blue. If I pick the uh, you know the background right over here, the background goes light blue. So this is a way that you can use that sort of funky looking mat. And I'm going to uh, go out of context mode right here. Tilde, swipe down, go to tool output. And once again, I can see the output of anything that I've got selected at that time. So these funky uh, object IDs and material IDs are going to be very useful because you can output lots of different mats within one render pass or render element. The next series of tips and tricks here are kind of a workaround and some of my favorites actually when using Quicksilver. Whether you're using Quicksilver by itself or you're using Quicksilver in tandem with other renderers. 
Um, what you can see here is I've got an animation from our friends over at Salesman Buck of just our character spinning. But I've combined a couple of different uh, looks in this actual file. Right here you can see that I've got an output and this is just the raw render I've got r right down here. And this is the realistic mode from the nitrous viewport. So this is not one of the cartoon looks. It's got soft shading. There is no cartoon outline and I'm just using standard uh, old, literally the file or the um, shader type called standard. So these are not art and design. This is just an old school standard shader. If you look right here, I've got, you know, an ambient occlusion pass that we did. Uh, you might be asking yourself, how, well, how was that done? I'm about to show you. Some other passes that we did here get, getting a little bit tricky is just this cartoon outline pass that we've got for our particular character. And then one more, what might be called a lighting pass. And this is this would be lighting and shadow in the scene. And uh, these three, well, especially uh, ambient occlusion and lighting pass, would be render elements that you would typically want to get out of uh, something like 3ds Max using Mental Ray. But as we saw earlier, we only have uh, Alpha, Material ID, Object ID, and Z Depth for our render elements. So the way that we're going to do this is combining a couple of new features and old features alike. If I come under the render dialog and I'm going to evoke the state sets, this is a new feature that came out with uh, 3ds Max. 2012 subscription advantage pack that was released at SIGGRAPH uh, 2011 in August. And I'm going to also bring up the material editor. What I'm going to do to, is first make a state set and uh, if I, well before I do that I'm going to uh, just go ahead and hit render to show you that this scene is pretty straightforward. I'm using the realistic draw mode of nitrous to get my base render and I've set the environment map to be white. What I can then do is say, I'm going to right click and, uh, or let's just uh, sort of half slow click there. And I'm going to call this uh, state set Quicksilver AO. And then I'm going to hit record. And when I hit record, these changes are going to take effect and basically record changes to the setup of materials, lights, renderer, and, and et cetera. So what I can do now is just go ahead and say, let's make a standard shader. This, this is the old school standard shader. So ST, whoops. STA standard shader. And I'm going to make this pure white. And I'm going to apply this to everything in my scene. And now if I go back through, let's turn off record. And if I go back through and in, into our renderer, I just want to check that I have, uh, let's just take a look at it before I do any other, any other changes. Okay. So what we've got actually right now, just by doing that right there, is our, is our lighting pass. This is in fact, if I look at over to the renderer, and one more thing I wanted to check, actually let me turn off our ambient occlusion, and I think you can see where we're headed with that one. This is our lighting pass. So in this, there's actually directional light and also shadows from our lighting pass. So this one would be our lighting pass, and I might want to rename that Quicksilver Light. And then what we can do is just make another one and say, let's make a copy of this material. This will be called Quicksilver AO. I'm going to hit record on this one. And you can see that uh, we're back to our original state. If I select everything in my scene, this particular file, this one I might want to call AO. And the only difference here is that it is 100% self-illuminated. So if I apply this to everything in my scene, and then turn off shadows and turn on ambient occlusion. Now, if I, with this uh, particular state set active, if I do a render, and an important thing to reiterate is I'm rendering this on a white background. Now you get our ambient occlusion pass. So here we've got ambient occlusion. If I enable this one right here, it's gonna be our lighting pass. And if I turn off the state sets, we're back to our original realistic look. So here's our realistic view. And then the last one we want to do is uh, let's create one more state set. And this one will be called um, lines or quicksilver lines might be more accurate. But let's once again hit record. I'm going to apply this to everything in my scene. And then under the renderer, I want to choose a instead of realistic, I want to choose something like uh, ink with no ambient occlusion, no shadows, no indirect illumination, no reflections, nothing. And then uh, let's go ahead and turn that off and do a test rendering. So this is going to be white on white. And the only thing that will render is our white outlines. And once again, as you saw with Bobo's script, the NPR Explorer, you can control the thickness of these lines and so on. 
And that's going to be th uh, three different ways to use the st uh, state sets toolkit introduced with the subscription advantage pack to uh, knock out some quick ambient occlusion, cartoon outlines, and also lighting passes. And once again, you can see that these are all, you know, very easily to easy to just comp in. And some food for thought here is maybe you're doing an animation with the scanline renderer using standard shaders and you don't have the ability to render out an ambient occlusion pass. Well, as opposed to knocking over into something like Metal Ray, this is where you could uh, render out, and these, these uh, ambient occlusion frames were rendered on hardware using Quicksilver in about five seconds per frame. So typically an ambient occlusion pass might take quite a bit longer than that because you're using a software renderer. And this is a, just a way to uh, cheat time, if you will, and get a hardware version of ambient occlusion. Likewise, we have hardware lighting with shadows and hardware cartoon outline. So those are just another quick couple of ways to get uh, some more render elements, if you will, out of the Quicksilver renderer, despite its uh, limitation at this time of four uh, render elements. A couple of more tips and tricks in composite don't necessarily relate exactly to Quicksilver, but I'm gonna use Quicksilver renderings to show them. Um, the first one is, if you notice this piece of footage that I have uh, caching to disk right now, if I select it, it's actually just this acrylic one. And these are, I've grouped these under uh, just the, the uh, color grouping, which isn't really a tip and trick. You just select some nodes and right click and say, you know, create a group or a visual group in this case. Uh, I've got the colored outputs and black and white outputs over here. I'll get to this paint node in a second. But the first tip and trick is related to the bit depth. These are PNGs that I rendered out as 48-bit PNGs or 16 bits per channel. And you can see that right here. There's 16 bits per channel. However, the, the recording that I'm doing right now is on a laptop. So my media cache for Autodesk Composite is actually the, the root drive. There is no hardware RAID in this machine. So to get better performance out of this, what I can do is take the output of this composite and temporarily work in 8-bit. So this is going to mean that what's getting cached to disk is a much sm smaller file size than actually what would be ultimately rendered out when I would switch this out. So while I'm working, this is just a workflow thing on a, on a lesser machine. If you don't have a RAID array with Autodesk Composite, you can just say, let's work at an 8-bit bit depth for the output of my comp. But all the source material might be 16-bit or float or half float or whatever you want to work with. And then ultimately when I'm done, uh, you know, and I think my composites are looking good and I like the way that things are flowing, I can come to my output, switch that to be uh, have floating point or whatever you want to output, um, even up to full float. But working at 8 bits while you're working and caching to disk is a really nice uh, time saver, especially on a weaker machine. So another tip and trick here is this uh, business that I've got going with the paint node. One of the things that I really like about uh, composite is that you've got a lot of different ways to, to do just that, composite. Under the co composition cat category, you're probably familiar with blend and comp, and it has a front and a back, and this is basically an A over B composite. There's built-in color correction tools and also our blending modes, and that's a great way to you know, put two things together, you know, an A over B. However, one of the things that I like about the paint node is a very hidden little feature. If I go into a new paint node and just, you know, start painting, I, that's not that big a deal. But if I just start painting away, well, then I can say add another layer and maybe pick another color or whatever. And then I just start painting. Here you can see that our layers are stacking up and we have things like opacity and blending mode or transfer mode. And this is what is going to be really great for all of our render elements. And what's nice about this paint tool is that you can use it as a compositor. So this is especially useful if you're doing things like uh, render elements. So let's take, for example, uh, I'll just uh, move this around a little bit, get some screen real estate here. Let's say, for example, I just wanted two layers and I wanted to do a basic uh, composite of our technical look. And I want to just check that that's on the background layer. And let's maybe F2 to rename this tech. And then our foreground layer would be our ambient occlusion here. Let's just wire that in, go to our paint node. Once again, F2, I'm going to rename that AO and change that to a multiply transfer mode. And because these layers are perfectly aligned, our paint node is taking care of that. And I can even adjust the opacity of our, of our ambient occlusion and see that in real time. So this is a, just a quick example I'm going to delete. And if I go to this one that I put together here, 
I can even in increase the resolution or the uh, you know screen real estate for all of my composite, uh, all my 2D compositing here. And I'm just using this paint node, and it might be better renamed uh, 2D comp of render elements or something like that. Whoops, I wasn't typing. How about R E comp render element comp? So instead of using this as a paint node, I'm just using this and taking advantage of all those different um, transfer modes, opacities, and etc. So here I could start to say, let's look at all these things. And I've ahead of time, I've obviously adjusted these, but this gives me the ability to say, let's look at the lighting, the ambient occlusion, and the lines. And I'm just toggling the visibility here. And then maybe let's see what those look like composited over the realistic. And then let's maybe turn off ambient occlusion. And you can just see that I can play around with this quite dramatically and just see, you know, what do I want as my output and then ultimately render it out. So because the hardware Quicksilver is a hardware renderer, it gives me a lot of options to, you know, render out a ton of different passes and then see what anything's going to look like just by enabling our uh, 2D layers in a paint node. So once again, this is not necessarily something that's tied to Quicksilver. But using uh, render elements from any application with Autodesk Composite in a paint node like this is really phenomenal. It's a great way to comp in much more of a Photoshop-like uh, layer-based workflow as opposed to doing uh, cascading um, blending comp nodes. It's just an alternative and it's just another uh, option. This last tip pertains to uh, texture resolution when using Nitrous. Right now, I'm actually looking at the preferences for DirectX, which is the older way of doing things. It's still a valid way of doing things directly in the viewport within 3ds Max. However, with Nitrous in the 2012 release and later, uh, you're going to be able to take advantage of a lot more things in the viewport and as well as Quicksilver. So if you're familiar with this dialog, this is where you can set up texture resolution limits so that even if I'm working with, say, a 4,000 pixel by 4,000 pixel image, I'm clamping the resolution that it's going to be on either the uh, a texture resolution right here or the background resolution. As you can see, I've got a background out there. However, if I uh, revert out of this and go over to Nitrous, um, what you can see here is that I don't have the ability to configure this. The way that Nitrous works, and I'm going to let you guys kind of look at this a little bit on your own because it's detailed in the help files is that it uses the asset management system for rendering proxies. So if you go to um, asset management, under the jewel manage asset tracking, here you can evoke the bitmap performance and memory option and enable the proxy system. So proxies are gonna be the way that Nitrous actually handles it by default Nitrous is going to load bitmaps at their full resolution, no matter even if it's a 4,000 by 4,000 pixel image or you know 10,000 by 10,000. It's going to try to load the entire full resolution image onto the video card. And that's why, obviously, higher end video cards are going to be more advantageous when you're working with Quicksilver and or Nitrous in general at all, regardless of the renderer that you're using. So a workaround on this and a way to get back to sort of the old way of doing things is a little bit of a, a hack here. If I come under my uh, program files, Autodesk 3ds Max 2012 scripts startup and just double click this script right here. This is a simple two line script that I'm running every time I launch Max. And I'm going to include this uh, in my blog at the area. So here you can see Nitrous Graphics Manager set texture limit size is and I'm doing it to 1024 by 1024. This gives you the background and texture resolution very much like the old way of doing things. So this is a way that you can clamp. Uh, the resolution of your textures on the graphics card as well as in the nitrous viewports. So this isn't going to be something for everybody. This is going to be, uh, you know, if you want it to be the old way and you want to have manual control, especially if you have a weaker video card. But if you are working with nitrous and or the Quicksilver hardware renderer, I highly recommend uh, understanding that the the way that the texture resolution is clamped or not clamped depending on the use of this script. So that's going to do it for me. Um, with that, I want to thank you all. Uh, this was been this has been a uh, presentation for Autodesk University, and uh, also the uh, area area.autodesk.com. Once again, my name is Gary Davis, and I thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you got a lot out of Quicksilver hardware rendering with 3ds Max 2012.